Bro Code, Article 35. A bro must never watch a romantic comedy. <laughs> bro Code, Article 8. A bro must never send a birthday card to another bro. <laughs> bro Code, Article 41. A bro never cries. The Bro Code has 125 articles, and I first learned about the Bro Code, available at brocode.com, from Mason, a junior in high school. I never met Mason before, but he'd agreed to meet with me, or more accurately, he'd had his arm twisted by his mom, my former coworker. I've spent the past three months talking to boys and young men like Mason. I reached out to them because I wanted to understand what it means to be a man in 2020. What I found is that our culture's definition of masculinity is broken. It's outdated, it's flawed, and it's emotionally and psychologically dangerous. In the past 50 years in America, we've redefined what it means to be a woman. Young girls today are told that they can do anything, be anyone. The author Ruth Whitman jokes, that if parents today were naming their children after virtues like the Puritans used to do, no girls would be named Charity or Grace or Patience. Instead, half of all baby girls born in America would be named Empowerment <laughs> or Assertiveness. <laughs> of course, it's still incredibly difficult to be a woman in 2020. Girls today, women today, they face centuries of prejudices that have calcified over the years and we're just beginning to chip away at the surfaces. But we're at least beginning to have nuanced conversations around what it means to be a woman. Young girls today are taught that femininity can take many different forms. Our boys, though, have been left behind. There are many interpretations of masculinity, and millions of men subscribe to their own definition. But our culture's predominant definition of masculinity equates masculinity with machismo. We tell boys to equate sensitivity with weakness. We tell them to man up to suppress their emotions. We tell them that boys don't cry and tell them to take it like a man. We put our boys in emotional straitjackets. When I was in high school, you could hardly go a day without hearing the words, no homo. When a guy saw another guy in the hallway, he would often maybe hug him and say, no homo, just to indicate that, in case anyone was wondering, he definitely isn't gay. <laughs> now, the University of Oregon sociologist C.J. Pascoe has actually done research on no homo, sifting through more than, more than 1,000 different tweets that included the phrase. And what she found is that many of these tweets simply expressed a positive emotion, something innocuous like, I love chocolate ice cream, hashtag no homo. <laughs> I did my own search online, and I found that many tweets were from young men to their male friends, and they expressed things like, I miss you, or let's hang out soon. Pasco concluded that no homo is a form of inoculation against insults from other guys. It's a shield that allows boys to be fully human. Now, I want to be clear that this isn't about sexual orientation. As a gay man, it's true that I've been unusually sensitive to stereotypes around masculinity in my life. But it's also given me a perspective, a different perspective, a view that's unvarnished of our culture's expectations of manhood. Meanwhile, I've watched straight friends, as well as gay friends, as well as myself, suffocate under the weight of these expectations. In infancy, there's no difference between the sex's need for emotional connection or in their capacity to show emotion. There's actually some evidence that male infants are more emotionally expressive than females. But soon that begins to shift. The Harvard psychologist William Pollock notes that by adolescence, boys become shame-phobic, convinced that peers will lose respect for them or see them as lesser if they talk about personal problems or discuss their feelings. The author Liz Plank notes that boys have their gender constantly surveilled for any sign of misstep or mistake. Boys, she says, become fluent in emotional self-censorship. 
There's a George Orwell story called Shooting an Elephant. And in the story, there's a colonial policeman who's tasked with killing an elephant running wild in his village. And he's told to do it without showing a hint of hesitation or remorse or regret. But he's torn apart inside. The sentence that Orwell uses to describe how the policeman felt is he wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. From a young age, our boys wear masks. And those masks soon become how they view themselves. Hardened, tough, unflappable. They become disconnected from the emotions in their life, severed from any intimacy. It's that disconnection that leads to a loss of empathy. Speaking with Mason, I was struck by how his language when talking about girls was rooted in violence. Pound, nail, hammer. Women were dehumanized, objects, a means to claim a place in the hierarchy of masculinity. This is dangerous. This disconnection, this loss of empathy, it leads to isolation, loneliness, desperation, leads to men lashing out. 97% of school shootings have been by men. Men are three and a half times as likely as women to kill themselves. Nearly half of domestic violence or female homicides are the result of domestic violence of men. Our boys are trapped. Our men are suffocating. And they can't even tell us that they're suffocating because we haven't allowed them the emotional vocabulary to cry out for help. So what can we do about it? We can start with our parenting. I feel so lucky to have been raised by my dad. My dad, my mom passed away when I was one, and my dad raised my brother and me on his own, and he is the most emotional and sensitive man you'll ever meet. He cries like 12 times a day. <laughs> he calls me honey and my special one. Every single morning growing up, my dad woke me up by coming into my room and softly singing, Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles while turning on the lights. <laughs> my dad has shown me that men, straight men, can be sensitive and that compassion and vulnerability form the foundation for the strongest relationships. Change starts with parents. Parents can encourage their boys to talk about their emotions. And parents can talk to their boys about their emotions, too. In doing so, they can normalize emotional discourse. This is especially important for fathers and father figures, or maybe it's a male role model or school teacher. Men need to see emotional, reciprocal, healthy relationships with boys, that connectivity that's built on depth and nuance. And we can stop gendering things. So much focus has been on asking women to lean in, to speak up, be assertive, power pose in the bathroom before that next big meeting. <laughs> we can also tell boys to be sensitive, to be vulnerable, to listen more. We can treat people as people, first and foremost, not as men and women. Gender today tells us how to behave instead of letting us behave in the way that's natural to who we are. If something's aggressive, we can say that it's aggressive and call it that, not masculine. If something's feminine, we can say, or if something's nurturing, we can say that it's actually just nurturing and not feminine. These categories are constructions of our culture. There's nothing inherently more masculine about being brave or strong any more than there's anything more inherently feminine about being gentle or kind. We can rewrite the rules of our culture. The women's movement has redefined what it means to be a woman in 2020. It's time we redefine what it means to be a man. Thank you. Thank you.